broadcast, which I know you're doing. Now, we are joined by Dan Fight, who is an investigative journalist. He's reported there at the Capitol in Minnesota. He also runs a popular news site. A few weeks ago, he broke video along with his team of the state police pulling up and taking young people to give them heroin, cocaine, marijuana, you name it, and then bringing them back and dumping them out at Occupy. Now, we've seen this in Austin and in New York and L.A., where they take uh, the homeless, the mentally ill, prisoners, and tell them, you'll be arrested if you sleep anywhere but at Occupy. Then they come and aim cameras at the homeless guys defecating everywhere. Now, regardless of what you believe at, uh, about Occupy Wall Street, they have a First Amendment right, and this is part of a black op program to demonize these groups. And when we had Dan Fight's video that was obviously real state police, obviously real cops saying, turn your cameras off, the police came out and said it wasn't real. And they came out and said we were conspiracy theorists. And now they've come out in the local papers, we'll show screenshots of those there on screen, and have said there's no truth to this, but yes, it's true. So it's, it's a new level of doublespeak talking to you. Uh, like you're an idiot. Uh, so just amazing. We also have a press release uh, put out by the state. And again, all of that is up at Infowars.com and also on our guest uh, website that you'll see under him. Uh, Dan, fight. You are certainly fighting tyranny. Uh, wow. Uh, so big reversal. Why are they now admitting that they're taking young people to put them on drugs? Well, essentially, the uh, story that the uh, state police put out was that a uh, police officer in a rural town called Hutchinson um, uh, stepped forward, told his uh, uh, his police chief that, yes, in fact, he had seen uh, a state trooper distributing marijuana. And um, at that point, uh, you know, supposedly the wheels started turning and they started having an internal investigation. Also, uh, the major local daily, the Star Tribune, in uh, their coverage of the story, now, uh, they are claiming credit because they interviewed one of the DRE participants who named a specific officer, and then uh, the Star Tribune inquired uh, around noon that day about that officer, and then by about 5 o'clock, that officer had been suspended um, in the state patrol. So, uh, you know, suspensions have taken place. Um, I've heard the FBI has started uh, questioning people, so they're trying to kind of cover their end of things. Um, and, uh, and frankly, the local media is now having to... To actually take these things seriously because now obviously they, they don't necessarily believe what regular people say but once the authorities confirm that something is going on uh, then they had to run with that story it's been very interesting to uh, talk with the journalists and see uh, the, the press layer of this because nobody uh, in the media business, nobody likes to confront these un uncomfortable issues of the war on drugs. Uh, one reporter told me that they had to essentially fight their management for days to finally get a story out, but once the official wheels started turning, then they could finally do a story. So uh, those wheels are turning, and, um, and I think that uh, it's given a lot of political impetus to a lot of different activists around town, kind of affiliated with the Occupy movement and more broadly. Uh, last night, uh, people were uh, sleeping out in front of the U.S. bank, fighting against its uh, you know fraudulent system of uh, stealing houses and stuff. Uh, several houses are occupied in the Twin Cities in defiance of eviction orders and that kind of thing. So we're seeing a real strong presence on the streets, uh, a real strong momentum among uh, different you know, social movements. And I think that uh, highlighting this kind of abusive behavior has uh, helped drive that forward. Well, Dan, you also pointed out that the banks you're there protesting have been caught laundering hundreds of millions of drug money. Bloomberg reported Wells Fargo and its subsidiary Wachovia laundered $376 billion from just 2008 to 2010. That broke in 2010. Uh, so it's a joke to have the police out who will pull over a teenager and take him to jail for drugs, but then they're there pushing it on them. Uh, last time you were on, I ended up playing a clip later of Geraldo Rivera admitting the troops grow the opium. Then it's shipped here, but if you're caught with it, you go to jail. Uh, meanwhile, the doctors are pushing, you know, synthetic opiates on the public. Rush Limbaugh's been addicted to them. It's a joke. You don't treat drug addiction by putting people in prison, and all that does is train them to be criminals. Yes. You make drugs illegal, now they cost 100 times or more. People rob you. That's just a tax to the banks. You kill mm -hmm. the, uh, 
this whole drug system by decriminalizing. And I know I'm ranting, right. but but this just shows what a fraud it is, and it shows it how is. deceptive they are. It's one thing to have college students uh, volunteer or police volunteer to be part of a drug program to take drugs so they can recognize it if drugs are still going to be illegal. But it's another thing entirely to use it as a way to basically, and what you said a few weeks ago has now come out, I noticed, they were giving them drugs and money to get them to be informants to go set up and make stuff up about Occupy Wall Street, yes. just like they did at the RNC four years ago where they set people up. Uh, yes, and uh, I think that it's also prompted a broader discussion across the whole movement about a wide variety of, of shady and similar incidents that happen in, in many, many cities. Um, so I, I think uh, getting that discussion going again is very important. And, and I want to add, too, that uh, I worked, uh, you know, covering issues at the state legislature for four years, and I made it a very special point to go out of my way to talk to legislators behind closed doors about the war on drugs, about how uh, prohibition creates a flow of uh, laundered drug money through the banking system. And uh, while one clever legislator said that uh, making it a cause of action for civil lawsuits against the banks to essentially claw back the equity that they extract from neighborhoods in the way that Wells Fargo does, for example, that would be one possible uh, remedy the state legislature could have to uh, fight this uh, laundered drug money system. I also would add um, people at the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension uh, told me that they do not have access to the uh, wire transfer system at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And so that's an example of how at the state level, uh, the flow of laundered drug money is essentially uh, firewalled off uh, from the local officials, and then instead, uh, federal grant programs. In Minneapolis, we have something called the Safe Streets Task Force, um, which is kind of a little similar to the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and there's a lot of uh, operations with federal informants that are involved there and that kind of thing, and that's another, yet another uh, kind of drug program that has no functional oversight. Um, there's yet another program in St. Paul going on right now called Clean Sweep, which is, uh, uh, you know, searching lots of people people uh, in minority neighborhoods. Uh, certainly the St. Paul police are, are not going to treat people in the white neighborhoods in the same way. So uh, it, it's a real step forward to have uh, this program suspended right now um, and have those expenditures suspended, which is the direction things need to move. But whether or not we can have a, a decent debate about uh, the actual problems of the war on drugs, that does remain to be seen. I, and I give credit to uh, City Pages for being the uh, local publication, which at least is uh, getting to the serious issues of drug war corruption in our state. And notice, Dan, how upfront they tried to deny this even existed. I mean, when TSA mm -hmm. was caught starting to go in the pants of people three years ago, they said for a year, we're not doing this till thousands of videos came out. It's a policy to lie to us, like the police and military are an occupying army, and we're some enemy that's just to be lied to. All they're doing is discrediting themselves. And I'm seeing, I mean, when Pat Robertson comes out and says decriminalize marijuana, you know their war on drugs is, is really on its last legs. The question is, what are these big banks gonna do when they can't tax us by their uh, customers mugging us and stuff to buy their overpriced drugs. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we have to keep uh, driving the debate forward. We have to keep insisting that uh, people like the mayor explain themselves, to take a stand, to explain uh, how does the corruption and drug prohibition work. You know, I I, I can't help but uh, wander around town, and when I, you know, talk to somebody, they're just like, yeah, the, the police just planted drugs in our car after they searched it, you know, and they laughed at us and said, yeah, we're going to plant it. What are you going to do? You have a public defender. So that, you know, that type of abuse is just reproduced at one local police department after another. Um, and, uh, and by the know, way, I, I knew about police stealing drugs in Dallas. That's why I was in high school five years. I, we had to move to Austin, and my dad sold his dental practices just because the police were, through lawyers and people, threatening to kill me and, and, and taking me to jail for stuff and saying, we're going to plant drugs on you. This, and then later, the sheriff, uh, McWhorter, got busted in Rockwell. You can look it up right after I moved by the feds flying drugs in. So so that's on record that happened. This is so ubiquitous. Take Dallas, again, where I'm from. A few years ago, they got caught pulling over nice cars, throwing bags of chalk in it, and the Dallas Police Department would certify it as cocaine and take their car. I mean, this is a criminal enterprise. Alcohol prohibition ended in the 30s. The police have been corrupted. They were addicted to the money. They wanted the high life. They made narcotics and marijuana illegal shortly after and went into business controlling that. And that's all this is. Let's be honest. Government and big corporations control over 90% of it, and they just use it as a way to put people in private prisons 
working for 25 cents an hour, displacing all our jobs. Good old boys say, make them criminals work in prison. They got hot tubs and cable. No, they don't. They're there learning how to be criminals if they weren't before, nonviolent people, taking our jobs on the outside. It's so elementary. The bank ship the drugs in, then they own the big private prisons and put the drug slaves in the prisons. I mean, that is a masterful mm -hmm. profit structure. Yeah, it, it is a, a, a truly ugly cycle, and obviously it just keeps accelerating. And so um, what I am hoping is that uh, out of all of this, that, you know, that discussion needs to move forward. And I think that social activists across the spectrum need to start uh, looking at this more seriously. I am I'm hoping that the Occupy movement can, you know, keep that rolling more seriously. But I would also add, uh, this was uh, pretty cool that um, uh, a few days ago, uh, labor unions were um, had taken intersections near uh, the U.S. bank uh, area on Nicollet Mall, which is right up from PV Plaza. And they had, they had taken, uh, you know, one intersection and then the police had said, move or we're going to arrest you, blah, blah, blah. They're bringing in the paddy wagons and people started chanting the name of the program DRE DRE they chanted that and man those police backed off I am telling you the police in Minneapolis the mayor even the mayor did not show up for the first time ever he did not make an appearance at the the May Day parade which is a major event in the kind of you know uh, left side of town uh, down in Powderhorn he wasn't even willing to walk the parade because they're trying to extort us with a stadium right now which is you know pretty unpopular around the city and you know stadiums are themselves monuments to you know chemical dependency and consuming more alcohol, but also with the DRE program. I don't think the mayor wanted to face uh, the, the angry public over these different issues. Uh, so we're seeing that uh, we can, uh, if we push back, we can actually start getting real yes. traction. And so if everyone does this in their own cities, if you start like taping drug corruption, you know, get your cell phones out, um, you too can, uh, you know, get some mileage going and, and try to get ugly programs like this shut down. Well, Dan, all over the country, people are waking up to this, but they're also waking up to Al-Qaeda being a Western creation. It's in the major papers that, oh, we are using Al-Qaeda to attack Syria, but this is good Al-Qaeda. But then I've got to give my rights up because Al-Qaeda is hiding under my desk and wants to get me. I mean, people are really waking mm -hmm. up that drugs, terrorism, all of this is simply a pretext to take our freedoms. Uh, yes, and I, I think, um, you know, the role of uh, private military contractors for, you know, several decades remains to be, you know, uh, formally laid out, even though uh, those of us that have researched it feel the problem's fairly obvious. Um, and, of course, uh, Sibel Edmonds, uh, the FBI whistleblower, uh, you know, recently released her new book, Classified Woman. Um, I followed the Edmonds case for a long time because that involves uh, the drug trafficking networks across Asia. And, um, you know, we have the NATO summit coming right up. We, we should probably ask the question, about what is the role of NATO, uh, Sibel Edmonds said that uh, NATO planes have been used to build up uh, Islamic fundamentalist militias around Asia and Europe to essentially perform their logistics, move them through Turkey, and then up into the Caucasus and uh, Balkans-type regions. So uh, the role of NATO in particular as an organization, I think, is probably one of the next places we should start looking, as well as, obviously, the American banking system. That's right. The Al-Qaeda and other groups, whether it's in Albania, you name it, work for the banks. And then they, the banks use them to menace us so the banks can take our liberties and freedoms. It's a banking dictatorship. It's global banker occupation, and they're not free market. They use crony, insider, monopolistic tactics to shut down yeah. the little guy. They are parasites, and they are the enemy. In closing, they're acting so paranoid and lying so much here, out of hand and being caught, mm -hmm. uh, that this looks like this is a lot more than just a program uh, to test drugs. Uh, are, are you getting any other uh, chatter on what else may be going on? Because you see one cockroach, uh, when you turn the lights on, there's more. Uh, yeah, and, and I think, uh, you know, that's one of the major reasons why a lot of people could relate to the video is because apart from the fact that, you know, a lot of people around town had experienced this in previous years before this year, um, uh, the war on drugs is a, is a very, you know, it's an enterprise that feels sketchy, you know, when you're on the real texture of it. And that's what everybody could really relate to. So I think that, um, you know, one, yeah, once you start turning up these rocks, more more things start uh, spilling out, more things start coming forward. And, um, and also, too, in terms of this particular particular program, uh, they're really trying to basically hang this on, you know, one or two rogue officers, classic limited hangout. 
but they're still not willing to uh, really forthrightly address the fact they were dropping off people intoxicated in public spaces. They're not willing to address the fact they didn't have, uh, you know, adequate medical coverage and ambulance available down at this facility in Richfield where this was going on. So again, there, there are still multiple levels of this case yet to be explored, but I am hoping that we can force accountability. We can force, uh, you know, people like the mayor and the state government to say, okay, well, we do recognize that, you know, banks do launder a lot of drug money. Like this is a consequence of prohibition. And um, they gain a ton of leverage by pretending that that's not the case. And so I am really hoping that we can keep chipping away at this because more of these things are going to keep on coming out. That's just the nature of the system. It is. I mean, you scratch a wall anywhere, you're going to find this stuff. And that's why everybody can just pick one little area they want to fight and it will move mountains. Dan Fight, thanks for spending time with us. Hey, great to be with you, Alex. I really appreciate the time. Oh, I appreciate you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, he's confirmed right. We're confirmed right again. The police trucking people to warehouses to give them any drug they want in exchange for basically going and spying on peaceful protesters. Classic. Absolutely classic. Great job to the crew. That's it for this edition of Info.